Good evening. Hello, hello. I'm Rob. Uh, I've been part of St. Michael's for ages. I worked out recently. I've now been part of St. Michael's for more than half my life. Getting old. Uh, I'm married to Vicky, who I'm sure you'll know is uh, one of the leadership team here at St. Michael's. My topic this evening, uh, the gospel of resurrection. Uh, perhaps translated, the good news of love defeating death. Way too big a topic for one sermon, possibly way too big for one lifetime. I'm going to try and lift the lid a little on this topic. I'm going to try and ask one or two big questions. I'm going to do some thinking out loud, and then I'm going to leave the professionals to reach any proper conclusions over the next couple of weeks. Uh, my, my talk this evening includes three spoiler alerts. Um, so my apologies for those. I will try and flag them as I go along so that if you do not want uh, any of these three stories spoiled, then you may put your fingers in your ears at the right moment. First spoiler alert is coming up. If you've never heard the Easter story before, you might want to put your fingers in your ears right now because Jesus came alive again. When our oldest son was about three, there was this beautiful coincidence of timing um, in that his ability to hear and understand a story coincided with Easter. He'd heard lots of the stories that Jesus told. He'd heard stories about Jesus' life. And in a, a sensitive, appropriate for a sort of three-year-old way, we had this incredible privilege of sharing with him the Easter story for the first time. And he heard that Jesus died and that that was sad. Uh, but then we were able to say that a couple of days later, somehow Jesus came alive again. And he sat and thought about that. And he looked up and he said, that was very clever. <laughs> and uh, I think he's right. Um, I think it was very clever. Lent is usually a time that we spend focusing on developing high quality habits as followers of Jesus and focusing on the story of the journey to the cross. This year, we're still in Lent, two weeks ahead of Easter itself, and we're diving into a spoiler alert series of talks about the resurrection. So uh, I'm sorry if you were waiting till Easter Sunday to find out what happened. I've ruined it. But Jesus came alive again. A, a, a disclaimer, I'm, I'm making the bold assumption with everything within everything I'm saying this evening that Jesus really did rise from the dead. You might want to contest that assumption. And it's a really important question to examine. There are excellent sermons out there. There are books, there are discussion courses, all examining the evidence for and against the actual physical resurrection of Jesus. I would recommend those sermons, books, discussions to you. There's one book in particular called Who Moved the Stone by someone called Frank Morrison. Almost 100 years old, this book now. It was published, first published in 1930. It's barely been out of print since. Frank Morrison set out to write a book to disprove the resurrection. He thought, I'm an intelligent chap. I'll study the evidence and quash this myth once and for all. So he studied all the evidence he could lay his hands on, investigated, thought, looked at it carefully, and reached the conclusion that there was no way it didn't happen. His book is actually subtitled The Book That Wouldn't Be Written. He set out to write a book called Who Moved the Stone to disprove it, and ended up writing a book still called Who Moved the Stone, uh, carefully explaining the evidence that proves that Jesus really did rise from the dead. I recommend a read of that book. Because either Jesus did or he didn't rise from the dead. Those are the, the two options. And given, given the impact that the life of Christ has had on world history, on culture, on our planet as a whole, more impact than any other individual who's ever walked this earth, it's got to be worth looking at the evidence, hasn't it? Working out what you think, and what the implications of that might be. But for the purposes of this talk, and in line with what you might expect in a Christian church, I'm working on the assumption that Jesus did actually rise from the dead. 
which brings us pretty neatly to our Bible passage this evening, the, the first chunk of 1 Corinthians 15. It could possibly be summed up in the words of verse 12. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? A little bit of background on 1 Corinthians. It's the first of two letters written by Paul, early church leader, to a church in a place called Corinth, which was in Greece, a church that it could fairly be said was in a bit of a pickle. They had come up with some pretty strange ideas. They'd had some fairly vocal disagreements, a fair bit of coming off the rails, if you like. And the bulk of this letter is dealing with these different difficulties, these tricky questions in turn, working through them one at a time. Most famously, chapter 13, the passage where Paul talks about love being more important than anything else. You'll have heard it at weddings and other occasions, I'm sure. No matter how good your theology, your miracles, your gifts, all of what you do, no matter how good it is, if you don't do it with love, it's all pointless. Quality piece of thinking, amazing Bible passage. But that's just one of several sections tackling these difficulties that the church in Corinth was facing. Interestingly, Corinthians is bookended, if you like, with the essentials of the Easter story. In chapter 1, there's a section that focuses very much on the death of Jesus on the cross, Good Friday. And then chapter 15, the last chapter in the book, focuses on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead at the end of the book. The Corinthian church is essentially saying, did the resurrection of Jesus actually happen? Will any of us actually experience resurrection ourselves? And Paul, putting it fairly bluntly, says, yes, Jesus did actually rise from the dead. He runs through some of the evidence for that. He says it's absolutely central to everything else. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there really isn't much point to any of this Christianity stuff at all. Verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. It says if Christ didn't rise from the, de the dead, our, our preaching is futile. So I'm really hoping he did. My, my big questions as, as I dig into some of this stuff are, are these. Assuming Jesus did come back from the dead, I am assuming that, how much difference is the good news of the resurrection making to us today? How can we engage with the truth and the grace of this story in ways that are genuinely meaningful, helpful, relevant, making a difference? And then perhaps most central question for me this evening, how can we live with a resurrection perspective in a world that's so constantly experiencing crucifixion pain? You don't need me to list the kind of pain that the world is suffering right now. It's everywhere. And that's my, my biggest struggle with this topic, if you like. How can we skip around with the daffodils and the chocolate eggs, singing hurrah, hurrah, Jesus is alive, when there's so much pain and injustice in the world? I once heard it suggested that Christians should try to live as if Jesus died yesterday rose today and is coming back tomorrow. It's quite a challenge, isn't it? And at first that quite appealed to me. A good recipe for zealous, fired up, energetic, passionate faith. But the more I think about it, the more it concerns me. I think it might also be a recipe for utter exhaustion, for burnout, for missed opportunities to connect with the depth of the Easter story at a far more real, intelligent, personal honest level, engaging, engaging with the suffering, dying, rising again Jesus in ways that ask, honestly, how can we live with a resurrection perspective in a world that's so constantly experiencing crucifixion pain? Difficult question. I'm only going to scratch the surface of it, of it this evening. Spoiler alert number two. In the autumn of 1994, some friends of ours, 1994, it's a long time ago, isn't it? Some friends of ours recommended a film to us. They said, go to the cinema, watch this film. And they said, we're not going to tell you anything else about it. Just go and see it. It was a film that back then nobody had heard of. It was called The Shawshank Redemption. 
And we got to see it at the cinema without knowing. Uh, who hasn't seen The Shawshank Redemption? One or two. Apologies. I'll try not to spoil it. You might want your fingers in your ears. It's not an easy film, um, but it is an amazing film. And seeing it for the first time in the cinema without knowing what happens, I'll try not to ruin it, uh, was incredible and, and kind of precious because you only get to see it without knowing once. You, you can watch it again as many times as you like, but it'll never have the same impact as when you watched it without knowing. I even find myself re-watching it now, trying to pretend I don't know, trying to imagine so that I can appreciate it as much as I appreciated it the first time. My first challenge for us this evening is to try and do the same thing with the gospel story. Can we try to engage with the Easter story this year, dialing our imaginations right up to full power, trying to grasp just a little of what it would have been like to live through the first Good Friday and then that empty Saturday and then the first Easter Sunday morning as if we didn't know how it was going to turn out. Can we get anywhere near feeling even the tiniest bit of what Jesus' friends and family must have felt as he was mocked and beaten and killed on a wooden cross that first Good Friday? The shock of the violence the pain of the injustice. He was being executed as if he was a dangerous criminal when actually he was completely innocent. Those lies being believed and upheld by the government, by the army. The apparent going wrong of it all. After all the thrills and spills of three years of believing that this man was the Messiah, the saviour of the whole world, the miracle worker who was somehow both God and our friend, who was going to make everything all right again, imprisoned, tortured, dead. His broken body, his cold, grey, dead body, hastily dragged into a hole in a rock before sunset before the sun set on everything we hoped for. I'm not sure if it's actually possible to grasp what it must have been like, as well as the colossal grief at the death of their friend, there was the apparent collapse of everything they believed in. Maybe it's a little bit like someone finding absolute watertight proof that Christianity isn't true and then burning down the church. It's a desperately imperfect analogy, but you see the kind of devastation I'm trying to approach. Everything we believed in fallen apart and then burnt to the ground. Is it possible to imagine any of that? For them, Jesus was definitely dead. They'd seen him killed. So following him isn't even a thing anymore. Christianity is definitely not true. The government is backing a campaign of violence against those who claim to believe in Jesus. He saved others. Why couldn't he save himself? This question that's called out by the mocking authorities as Jesus hangs on the cross dying. Why isn't he saving himself? A question that echoes through that empty Easter Saturday. This is one of the reasons why we here at St. Michael's and why loads and loads of churches on Good Friday, they hold a, a long service, sometimes three hours, sometimes longer, a service of meditation and prayer on Good Friday to try and give us the space to engage with just a little of the weight, the impact, the devastation of the events of that first Good Friday, to dare to allow our imaginations to connect with just fragments of that awfulness. Even though we've heard the spoilers, we know what Sunday morning will bring, but can we try to imagine for a moment what it would have been like to see Jesus killed without knowing how it would turn out? And then my second challenge is, is to ask if we can do the same thing with Easter morning. Can we try to hear that story as if we didn't know it yet? It's really difficult because we do know. 
Can we begin to imagine what it would be like if, say, one of our best friends had died tragically young, you know, a desperately unfair death? Imagine we'd held her hand while she was on the life support machine, maybe after a car accident or cancer, something grim and desperately unfair. We've comforted her mum. We've gone to the funeral. We've stood in the cold, seen her coffin lowered into the ground. We've cried and cried at the unfairness and the wrongness of it all. And we miss her so much. We don't know what to do with ourselves. And then a couple of us buy flowers and we go back to the cemetery and it's pouring with rain and we can't find the grave because the place we thought it was is just a hole in the ground again with a pile of soil next to it and we don't understand what's going on. And I ask this woman who's fetching a lawnmower if she knows what's happened and she turns to me and says, Rob, and it's her, it's my friend who died last week, standing there, smiling at me, alive. What would that be like? How would we tell anyone? Who's going to believe us? If Jesus really did come back to life like that, it changes everything. Spoiler alert number three. Has anyone seen the film Jojo Rabbit? Not many. Only, only a handful. Um, it's my absolute favourite film. It's not everyone's cup of tea, I have to admit. It was nominated for Best Picture a couple of years ago. Um, it's it very, very difficult to describe it. I'll try not to spoil it for you. It is completely and utterly bonkers. I mean, really bonkers. But at the same time, it's utterly, utterly beautiful. It, it's a very strange mix. It's set in Germany in the final months of World War II. And it's the story of the end of the war seen through the eyes of a young boy who adores Adolf Hitler. He's part of the Hitler youth movement and Adolf Hitler is his imaginary friend. He loves him. Very uncomfortable, very, very funny, awkward, bizarre, but extraordinarily beautiful. It's the story of this boy's journey of discovery through an unlikely friendship until his awakening from the delusions of the Hitler youth coincides with the end of the war. It is ludicrous comedy wrapped around this astonishing revelation. And there's this moment right at the end. Um, this is where I'll spoil it for you. Still watch it. Please watch it with all the caveats that it's crazy. But there's this moment right at the end where the boy's town is liberated from the Nazis and where he and his new friend stand outside in the street and together they dance. It's so moving. <laughs> Bear with me, I'll hold it together. It's, it, it kills me every time. It's devastatingly simple and desperately naive and awkward and completely beautiful, this moment of these two children dancing, a moment of celebration in the midst of utter brokenness and carnage. There's decades of rebuilding and healing and hurting and forgiving still to come across Europe, but the evil of Nazi rule is over and they dance. It's extraordinary, <coughs> holding it together here. At the same time, in real life, not in the film, in real life, Winston Churchill famously said, whilst announcing the end of the war in Europe, he said, we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. And he went on to say, but let us not forget for a moment the toil and efforts that lie ahead. Now, a I spoil this film for you because I think there are clues here about how to celebrate Easter with some kind of integrity. The gospel of resurrection is fizzing with the hope of new life. It's like the, the end of the evil of Nazi rule to the power infinity. Undeserved forgiveness, welcome, renewal, inclusion, wholeness, 
grace welling up to eternal life available to us all. We will be exploring and celebrating the impact of that new life more and more in the next couple of weeks, not least on Easter morning, and quite right too. But to live with a resurrection perspective in a world that's so constantly experiencing crucifixion pain, we must somehow hold on to the lament of Good Friday with one hand and the joy of Easter Sunday with the other often described as the now and not yet of the gospel. The art of celebration in one of our worship songs. Somehow living in complete empathy with all those of us who are suffering, often suffering desperately unfairly, as we see on our TV screens all the time. Living in total empathy with the suffering, but fueled by the hope, the promise, the love that in the end will overcome death forever. I told you it was way too big for one sermon. How can we begin to learn to live with that balance? Like the, the shape of 1 Corinthians with the, the cross at the beginning, these really tricky questions in the middle, the resurrection at the end. It's the shape of Easter weekend, isn't it? How can we begin to live with the pain of the cross on Friday, the impossibly difficult questions of faith on the Saturday? Why doesn't he save himself? And then the uncontainable joy of the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. How do we let that balance influence our lives for the better? Big questions lifetime of trying to answer them required one suggestion to begin and the answer I suggest is to learn from Jesus it's classic Sunday school answer the answer is Jesus isn't it I, I, I'm suggesting that we try and this is a challenge to myself as well but we try to re-read Jesus's story his example his teaching his parables his arguments his friendships his whole life looking for all the ways that he balances the inevitable pain of unjust suffering and the breathtaking good news, the grace, the truth, the joy, the hope of resurrection. He knows the end from the beginning. And I suspect that that balance colours every decision he ever makes. So those, those are my challenges to us this evening. Can we begin to imagine what Good Friday and Easter Sunday might have been like if we didn't know the end of the story already? And whenever we're reading any part of Jesus' life story in the Bible, to ask ourselves how his actions and his words are influenced by what he knows is coming, what he is choosing to do for us, because he loves us. If we had all the time in the world, we could start that right now. We could pick any story from any of the Gospels, the written accounts of Jesus' life, and try studying it through the lens of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. I was, I was toying with the idea of uh, squeezing in a 30-second Bible study at this stage on the story of the woman who breaks the perfume over Jesus while he's eating with the disciples. Um, uh, let me recommend that to you as homework. We don't have time to look at it now, but it's an utterly incredible story where actually um, she, she does what the women never got to do on Easter Sunday morning. She embalms his body. She is, they, they, they say if, if you're a prophet, you should know she's a sinner. And Jesus quietly acknowledged that she is a prophet. She breaks the perfume of his feet. Extraordinary. Anyway, I'll leave that as homework. Let's look at how Jesus holds on to both the unfairness of suffering and the joy of undeserved eternal life in all that he does. Never ignoring the reality of unfair pain in the world, of the fear that we've talked about that is so thirsty for love. And somehow being real about that pain and that suffering with that spark, that twinkle that we see in Jesus' eye. The twinkle in Jesus' eye that says, trust me, I've got this. It won't be forever. Love really does 
win. Can, it's probably a good time for the band to come back up. I've got one more thought to share, and then we can move smoothly into our next song. Of course, we are about to study one more Bible passage together this evening because we're about to break bread and share wine together. Possibly the, the best, most vivid kind of Bible study there is because we're not just reading it or thinking about it or discussing it. We're actually taking part in it, just like Jesus intended. And not, not just taking part in it, not even just acting out the story, but actually eating and drinking bread and wine, the broken body, the spilt blood of Jesus given for us in the pain of Good Friday so that we too can be filled with his Easter morning new life, the good news, the gospel of resurrection. He deliberately gives us this sublime piece of participative storytelling to remind us again and again of both Good Friday and Easter Sunday. This mystery, this picture that we can eat and drink. A story that actually becomes part of us. You are what you eat, we're told. The body of Christ becomes part of us as we become part of the body of Christ. The gospel of resurrection. <laughs>